Hi everyone and welcome to The Book Refuge and welcome to my deep dive and analysis of A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J Mass. So I think it was like over a month ago now that I decided to reread this series and really dive into each book and talk about just how it makes me feel and why this series is one of my favorites. And I mean, we finally have reached the best book in the series, which I think no one would deny that Akamath, as it is fondly known, according to Miss and Fury, in case you didn't know what the acronym was, some people don't, why this is such a favorite and why it means so much to so many people. So I have my notes down here, so you might see me look down a few different times, but the first time through, I really did enjoy the first book. I didn't have any issues with it. I thought it was great. I'd been hearing these stirrings about Resand, and I didn't, you know, understand why everyone was so into him. This was also before I was like into darker romances at all. So I didn't have like, ooh, I like the bad boy in this situation. I thought Tamlin was already bad enough boy as it was, and I didn't really have a problem with Tamlin either. But then I read this book, and holy Moses. So if you haven't guessed already, this is going to be a full spoiler review for this. I'm doing a deep dive on the series. I'm not just, you know, chit-chatting. If you don't know what this book is about, you probably shouldn't be here because going to get intense. Another thing that I said in the previous one is that I really wanted to look closer into more of the side characters for this one that are going to be more main characters in the next. That means paying a lot more attention to Nesta and Cassian and the other sisters to just make sure that I'm watching them this time because I feel like in other rereads I'm always like recent favor, recent favor. I'm not paying attention to you know, the inner circle or the other high lords like I'm just not paying attention to them and this time I definitely did that. There's there's one thing I really noticed this time too is that this book really felt like the seven stages of grief or five stages of grief. I've seen it done both ways because I think there's very distinct points where we see Feyre um, going through the pain and the PTSD part and then we see her go to the resignation but then we see her be angry and then we see her finally accepting like we see all these different phases of her and I think we get to see Reese kind of like poking at her at these different points because he never wants to treat her like she's broken or like she's weak or that she um you know isn't able to handle things for herself because that's exactly what Tamlin is doing and I mean just being honest there there there's a lot about Tamlin that I can be sympathetic to as well uh, I think that at the end of the day, we end up seeing that he wasn't that great of a guy to begin with. He was pretty weak. He let his father do something horrible to someone he supposedly considered a friend. And the way that things went down between Reese and Tamlin, which I was paying much more attention to this time, Yes, they both did things wrong, but Tamlin really spurs that on by being too weak to stand up to his family and by not warning Reese or having his friends back. And it just causes a lot of what happens to happen. And I blame Tamlin even well. I can understand the parts, the parts with Feyre, I can understand with Reese. The parts, or... I can understand with Tamlin, but the parts with Reese, I don't really think he has an excuse for, and I think it's his fault, and I think he gets an entire continent cursed because of some bad decisions that he makes. So, anyway. So let's kind of go character by character a little more here. So I want to... Um, Obviously, the most we have to talk about is we have to talk about Feyre. And we come into her in a very dark place. She has survived under the mountain. It's been a few months. She's now engaged to Tamlin. Life is slowly coming back to the spring court. There we meet um, Ianthe, who is a high priestess, who is taking care of a lot of things for Tamlin, who is trying to help. She's kind of like the PR lady 
who is trying to help make things look as good as possible. And Feyre is just an empty shell. So she's lost a lot of her fight. She's losing weight. She's not sleeping. She is throwing up at night. Um, and what she really needs is she needs a purpose and she needs someone to like help her focus all of her pain into something productive and instead we see her treated like a delicate little flower even though she's stronger now than she was before like she literally has a new body she has new powers and Tamlin is so number one just like he's he is thankful to her she saved you know the fey world she saved um his court he is thankful but in his thankfulness, he is just wrapping her up in a ball of cotton and not letting her do anything. And it's literally smothering her because she doesn't have anything else to put her mind on. She doesn't have anything else to focus on or to dive into because he's just like, oop, I'm just going to keep you wrapped up in a little bow and you're going to be my broodmare, which is a crude way to say it, but that's literally what we're coming to is that she's supposed to wear a pretty ring, smile, go to the parties, dance with him, sleep with him, marry him, and have Faye babies for them is what she's supposed to do. And Feyre, you know, she's not, she's telling herself she's happy with that and that it's going to be a good plan, but it's not a good plan. And we quickly see her spiraling and it's getting worse and worse. And then on her wedding day, in a dress that's not her, there's roses everywhere. R red, the color red is a trigger for her because of her own blood and because of the people she had to kill under the mountain. And Tamlin hasn't noticed any of those things. And there's literally a bloody trail of roses on the way down the aisle. Like, man, there's so many details I noticed more this time. And then... Reese shows up and he takes her away and we know at this point you know this is full spoilers so we know in a full spoiler sense that Reese is her mate and during this these times where she's going to marry Tamlin Reese has decided like that's what she wants that's what's best for her I'm not gonna tell her that we're mates he made himself pretty hateable under the mountain, even while doing some good things. And, um, and she was shouting down her bond for someone to help her to make it stop. And so Reese is still happy to play the bad guy to a certain degree. So he decides to call in his bargain that he made with her and she has to come to the spring court once a week or the night court once a week every month and so she decides he decides that now's the time to do that and he takes her away and there's nothing that Tamlin can do about it because there's a bargain and you know Feyre is still stuck in like no I love Tamlin this is what I want this is what I'm gonna do and we start this thing of Reese knows that she's very powerful now and he needs her help to defeat the evil that's coming to Prithian and he's trying to convince her of that and he starts by teaching her how to read, which I just think, like, how dreamy is Rhysand? Like, let's just think about it for a minute. This is his mate, who he's feeling very strong urges for, who he thinks is beautiful, who he has good chemistry with. Like, that hate to love energy, like, you know, it's good energy. And he was willing to let her be with his enemy, let her be there as long as she was happy. The minute that he realizes she's not fully healthy and that she's literally like dying, he steps in because he's like, you're not happy. I was willing to let you be there to have that happily ever after if it was a thing and it's not. And so he gets her to eat food. He's trying to teach her to read. And then when he sends her back, it goes right back into it. And Tamlin is more possessive than ever and like won't let her leave to the point where he now is locking her in the house. So we're really now like ratcheting up the abuses. And it's so painful to see because she sees a bit of the night court and she doesn't want to believe it, but it seems like a very like peaceful place 
for her where she could heal. But she doesn't want to believe that. She's like, no, it's going to be okay. I just need to get my head straight. And me and Tamlin, we're together forever. But Tamlin, he is grieving too. Like I said, I understand him quite a bit. Like some of the notes I have for him is like, he has his own kind of PTSD that he's dealing with. Um, but instead of him dealing with it, he lets it turn him into kind of a cruel creature. He lets it turn him into his father a little bit. He gets very possessive and you start to lose respect for him. He has cowardly tendencies. He will lie and keep things from Feyre, not trusting her to be strong enough, not trusting her to handle the truth. And it drives a wedge that just like can't be taken away. And though he tries to fix it by making love to her, by giving her gifts, by, you know, doing all these certain things, it just, it doesn't work. And it's really hard to see. And so, like I put in my notes too, I was like, my pity only goes so far to the point where to get revenge... Or to get her back when she's made it clear that she's leaving, he goes to their enemy. And that's just like, that's the line. Like, he's literally willing to sacrifice his own people. Because there's no way the King of Highburn's going to honor his deal. Like, he's just not going to do it. And the fact that Tamlin is willing to risk that is just so frustrating to me. Like, oh, it frustrates me so much. So... We have the moment where Tamlin goes too far and he locks Feyre inside and she has a panic attack and it is so painful and it hurts so much and Reese is actually able to like break it and send Morgan in to get her and bring her back and then we have this moment where Feyre decides, okay, come what may, whatever's going to happen in the night court, I know that Reese will be good to me and let me heal and even though it's still like grudging even though she still won't admit her attraction because she's still in love with Tamlin even though it's quickly falling apart with each choice that Tamlin makes that pushes her further away and Reese makes a very brave decision to bring her to Valaris and he tells her he's like this is the line that you can't cross I will bring you, I won't leave you alone here. Because that's the thing is he draws, he's like, I have stuff to do. Like, I'll bring you here. You can be safe. I'll leave you alone. You can be in the library. You can have your own space. But I need to go. I have things to do. There's a war coming and I want you to help me with it. But he still gives her that option. Like, he doesn't force her into one thing or the other. But when she decides to come, he tells her, I, this is the line you can't cross. If you come, if I show you this secret place, you, you cannot tell anyone. That's the line you can't cross. If you ever decide to go back, whatever you do, you cannot tell anyone about this place. And so we get to see Valaris and we get to see this beautiful little place that in Reese's last moments of freedom, he is able to rip the knowledge of Valaris out of every other high lord, fae, uh, upper Fae, Lower Fae, High Fae, <laughs> he's able to rip the knowledge of it out of every mind that ever knew of it. He's able to erase the name of Valaris so that there will be a haven for his people to be safe. But there's also a cost because he locks his friends and family away and he surrenders himself to being Amarantha's whore, Amarantha's slave. I feel like slave is better because Nothing about Reese makes him a whore, and that's not the right term for him. But he offers himself to be her slave to protect everyone. And it is, there's a lot of pain in this of sexual assault. There's a lot of triggers for that. The things that Reese goes through that he subjects himself to to protect others is... Number one, I mean, it's inspiring because it... Thank you, horn, outside of my apartment. That was great. <laughs> it, it will eventually, like, inspire Feyre to do something kind of the same. Not to the same level of, like, assault-wise, but to, you know, offer herself for her people. But through Reese, 
being willing to be vulnerable, being willing to share, we get to meet the inner circle and we get to meet Morrigan, Amran, <laughs> Cassian, and Azrael, who are just the most precious little bunnies ever. I love them so much. Um, <laughs> we have Cassian and Azrael who are full Illyrian. I think they're full Illyrian and they were raised with Reese since they were young. They trained together in the camps. They dealt with a lot of shit together and I just love them so much. So Azrael, he is the spy master and um, he's just this like really steady and um, strong force and I really I have a lot more to say about him when I do uh, Wings and Fury but it was so nice to like be introduced to him again and just see how great he is and Cassian who is just so amazing like let's see what notes I wrote about Cassian because I loved him so much on this read through like I always loved him but I was paying more attention to him and his interactions with Nesta because of you know, finding out that they're mates at the end of this one. And some things that I noticed about him is that, so he's the commander of the Illyrian army. He's smart, brave, and flirty. He has an eye for Nesta right away. Like we do see him um, notice her right away. And he's very harsh of Nesta. He has some very like strong things to say to her. Like he's the one who first voices what we feel about how Feyre's sisters treated her and how Nesta just like left Feyre to keep their family alive. Like Nesta was trying so hard to punish her father that she wasn't there for her baby sister. And Cassian, he calls her out on it. And I really, really love that. Like they actually have a very like antagonistic relationship. I can't wait to like be in their heads in the new series like oh I just can't wait to like read from their POVs it's gonna be so good and um he is Reese's ride or die he's so kind to Feyre like in that like joking big brother way like he's so oh just love him so much I love when um he trains with her when he's like helping her get stronger in her powers and things and also then when like when he's injured and broken at the end but he's still like reaching out for Nesta it broke my it broke me just a little bit it was so good and you get to see like a mini arc with that because when at the end when we're dealing with the mortal queens who are causing a lot of problems and who you know sell us out to Highburn because they want to be immortal um, he then gets respect for Nesta because he sees, you know, Cassian says, like, we will protect your people. We'll, we will do this. And it's kind of this, like, why would you? We're humans in your fae. And he's like, because they're innocent. We will fight for the innocent. And so I just love that about him. I love him so much. More, um, I'm really watching her more this time because I'm trying to see if her, like, arc is in place for the third book because I know that some people like didn't like how her sexuality is handled in the last book and I don't see the threads being put in besides the we get to see a lot of her backstory of how her her family treated her and how Lucian's family treated her and it's so hard to see just like the sexism that's in this world and when we're in the court of nightmares like how well basically how everyone has to act differently but a lot about how more has to just like take a lot of this abuse and how she's willing to do it because we all know that the court of nightmares is a facade so that we can protect Valaris which is our real home our real love so I really like more she is so she's the first one to just accept Feyre in and you know also like they know that she is his mate um and so there is some undertones of that like extra protection going on like why people are be willing to help Feyre so readily um is them having the knowledge of that and I just really I really liked it more is so good I would love personally in the new series if like her and Nesta 
became closer somehow just because, you know, if she's going to be with Cassian, um, we're going to spend even more time with the inner circle, uh, which could be really, really cool because I feel like more wouldn't put up with Nesta's shit and like doesn't care about her prickly exterior. She's just like, I'm going to give it to you real. And I think that they could have some really cool interactions in the new series. That would make me pretty excited. Um, and then we have Amarin and Amarin is someone I'm trying to pay attention to more as well because I think if of anything in this series, Amarin is my best bet about what may connect with the Throne of Glass series. If there is some like, you know, Easter eggs hidden, like Amarin is the one that I think could be just because she is this being she's not an Illyrian or a Fey or anything she's other she is seriously powerful um almost powerful to the point of being like she can do whatever we need her to do um but also she's awesome I love when she gives Feyre that necklace to wear when they go to see the bone carver is the bone carver but it's not really anything like it's just a pretty jewelry because I see Amar Amarin as like a dragon shifter like <laughs> that's like what I picture her as so I kind of picture her as like Smaug like in a human body <laughs> and it's like she likes the shiny things and like when she gets the blood rubies from the day court it's like ooh, pretty rubies and it's like you know these are like a death threat and it's like but they're pretty so I don't care <laughs> so I really, I really appreciate that about Amran. She, you know, it's like that, like, phenomenal cosmic powers, itty bitty living space. Like, that's how I think of, of Amran when I think of her. Um, and I love her flirty flirt with the guard in the day court. Um, I know we get to see more of that later on, but I, yeah, Amran, she's pretty amazing. I really like her, too, at the end when Feyre has went back to the spring court to kind of be a double agent and Amran's like why did you do this Reese what are you doing and she's like you better explain this plan to me right now like I don't care if you're the high lord like I'm more powerful than you tell me what the hell you're doing and I just really appreciate that. Lucian okay so frustrating in this book and I don't know how to feel about him going into the new series yet I'm excited to reread still um, Wings and Fury and see how I feel about his arc in there because the thing with Lucian is that he has so many chances to be on Feyre's side and he's either too afraid of Tamron or he's also refusing to listen to what is so obviously happening with Feyre and the only reason I feel like he completely jumped ship is because that he is mated with Elaine and that's just an interesting thing for me. Like, I don't know how to feel about Lucian, someone who I really liked in the first one, but that he doesn't stick up for Feyre at all just really, really bothers me. And granted, Tamlin, like, maybe he wants to stay on Tamlin's good side so that he can still try to help in some state, and if he makes him too mad, then there's, like, no hope of it at all. But I just don't... I just don't feel it. It's just Lucian's really frustrating for me. And when he shows up in the woods and tries to take Feyre against her will, it pisses me off so badly. Like, it makes me so angry. <laughs> and, I mean, I love it because Feyre winnows for the first time to get away from him, and it's amazing. But, oh my gosh, I get so pissed off during that scene. Like, there's red pen, like, all over my copy. It makes me so mad. So, Nesta, holy shit, this is the read where I am really starting to see Nesta. Now, I was never like everyone else. I was never hating on her, um, like, once I finished the series, yeah, I was hating on her in the first one. But even on this reread of, like, Akatar, I started to see where her compact, complex character is probably coming from and just how much anger, like, girl needs an anger management class. But she's also so fierce someone who already as a human like I cannot wait until we get to see some like training with her being high fae in her new series and to see her with Cassian I want to see some training scenes with Cassian and her so bad 
because girl is fierce. And I think Amryn even says it in one of just like, she's one to watch. And when she gets put into the cauldron and she literally like, she steals something back from it, which I know we talk like that's more in Wings and Fury where that comes up. But the fact that she's so pissed off that she's like, you're not going to do this to me without me taking some of you with me. And I love that about her. I love that she's just spitting mad. And I love that when she spills out of the cauldron, she's just like coming up swinging like, you mother effers, I'm not going down easy like this. And I love that she starts to see how she's changed. And you see a little bit of her like a, apologetics, but also not backing down and being like, I was in a lot of pain. I didn't handle it that well. I was young too. Like I know I was the oldest and I could have done this or this, but like they were all children. They're all, they're children now, you know, it's, there's no easy way to handle that when your mother dies and then your father just shuts down. And if you don't know how to handle it, it doesn't matter what order you're in. Like, it's not like there's huge years between them. You know, I feel like they're each only like two years ahead of each other. So being four years ahead of Feyre doesn't make you so much smarter or wiser or know how to handle life better. You know what I mean? And I love that she like promises to fight with Feyre that they won't give up and that um, they're going to do their fight in the human realm before everything goes horribly wrong for them, but that they're willing to do their part because they see how the, the night court Fey are willing to fight and die for them and like they're going to be willing to pull their weight on the human side. And I really, I really like seeing that. Um, I love it. Elaine, she still just feels very polite and not really prepared for life at all, whether that's human life or fae life. I really hope we get to see more come of her. I'm fine with the idea of her being like Oracle, like an Oracle. In the third book, we definitely get to see a little bit of that from her. I think that could be really interesting, like what kind of pressure and power there would be in having the powers that she has that she gets from the cauldron. I think that's a very interesting way to go. And I hope we get to see more of her. And of course, her kind of like love triangle she sort of has going later on. But in this one, there's still not much happening. She has mundane plans and then they get shattered and she just kind of stops with it. Like she just kind of freezes and isn't able to go on from there. Um, so, and she's made a dilution, which we'll see how that goes. Um, Ianthe, the crazy bitch who just wants power. That's what I wrote. She's also a sexual assaulter. And at this point, that's what we know of her. But there's definitely more of that to come. That we find out more about her and other people she's assaulted. And I just think she's disgusting. She feels slimy. She belittles Feyre's opinion and puts her down. Even when at that time, like, Feyre, like, literally doesn't give two shits about what's happening to her, she's fine with Ianthe doing everything because Feyre's not at home. And I feel like Ianthe takes advantage of that, kind of doing the duties of the mistress of the spring court and kind of just, like, putting Feyre, you know, wrapping her up in bubble wrap and just, like, pushing her away and just helping to belittle her and it's very frustrating um the king of highburn i was trying to pay a little more attention to him as well because he's probably something that i know the least information about um on my previous rereads because i'm usually reading these like for the romance and for my people and not paying attention to the other people as much but he's crazy powerful and he wants to take over the entire world. So he doesn't just watch Highburn, he wants Prithian as well. I mean, Amarantha was one of his generals and just look what he did with him. Like, did with her and it's horrible. So something else I just wanted to talk about too is like the different powers that Feyre has on display. So I was really trying to kind of like watch that more this time. 
And so we get to see them like building with her. Like we first get to see her accidentally slip into Lucian's mind at the dinner table one day. We see her, um, the shadows come out when she is trapped, um, when she creates, when she's able to winnow, uh, when Reese is injured, and also that time when like Lucian is trying to, um, trying to take her back. Um, we see her glow when she's having sex with Reese. <laughs> um, we see fire from her when she is fighting. And then we get to see like the water wolves when Valaris is attacked. Those are amazing. I love the visuals of um, her attacking her attacking them and like the wolves like jumping on them and like drowning the people where they stood. It's so good. Her fight with the, um, I can't remember what it's called. It's not the Inquisitor. I'm thinking of the Inquisitor because I'm reading Mistborn right now. But the Adder, the Adder, that fight is brutal and so good. And then, yeah, I just love seeing, like slowly seeing what all the powers are. Uh, it's just really, really fun. So... Yeah, those are just um, a few things that kind of stuck out um, to kind of talk about the overall plan a little bit. I really like when we go to the day court. I love a lot of the missions on this one. I love when Feyre goes to the witch's place and ends up getting the ring, which ends up being her engagement ring, which is so beautiful. I love when they go to the day court and we spend all this time with Tarquin and there's almost this like flirting with Tarquin where if she wasn't feeling so attracted to Reese, which we know it's because she's his mate, and also her friend. Like, he builds a friendship with her, and it's so good. It is that, like, sexy, like, we know there's tension in this, but Feyre is still grieving a relationship with Tamlin, so she's not rushing it. But, like, Tarquin is, like, easy and uncomplicated and light, and he's good and young, and he is willing to help with their plans. And something that... I think is a misstep on Reese's point is to not be fully honest with his plan with Tarquin. Like, I really think that the the king, the high lord that Tarquin is, that he would have been willing to help. And so it hurts me that, it hurts me that we have to break that relationship. I mean, it's, I know it's one we can build up later, but it hurts me that we can't just have tried to like explain it to him it's kind of frustrating to me um but I really like Tarquin I like that I like the mermaid like siren creatures that they recognize who Feyre is from helping their sister in the beginning and that they help them escape and I love when we go to the Illyrian camps even though these guys are douchebags but that we get to see what we're dealing with and that Reese has some like civil unrest in his own court and he has issues going on there and they just kind of all pile on top of each other. I love Sarah, how she slowly escalated this relationship that even though there's like seriously strong sexual tension between Reese and Feyre this entire time, it doesn't happen until like it's right. And I love that Reese is smart enough to know that he needs to tell her that they're mates before they would have sex even though he still like doesn't do it at the right time which that's just a classic romance trope like of course the girl's gonna find out the info before you get the chance to tell her that's just how it works but i love the uh cereal there's so many fun memes about the cereal out there you should look them up that it's this ugly like disturbing creature that likes pretty things and then just can't wait to spill the tea like I kind of think of this cereal as like being like Joan Rivers, you know what I mean? Like of the Fey world, where they just want to like pour the tea about things that are going on. Like I, I always think of the meme from Mulan when it's like pour the tea, the matchmaker. And so I think I was just like blurting out that Reese is her mate and then be like, oh, you didn't know. <laughs> and yeah, I think Feyre has the right to be pissed because 
she's like, okay, well, these feelings that I'm having for you, are they just because of the stupid bond or is it because I actually love you? Like you, you didn't give me all the facts, but I see Reese's side of he never thought he would find her. He thought he was doomed to darkness. And then, you know, when Feyre is like 15, which I assume, like, I think it's supposed to be like when she is going through, like when she's went through puberty now. Because it would make sense that she would have that later since they were poor and like starving most of the time. Don't always like go through puberty at the right time. There's no right time. Sorry. You know what I'm saying? But that they started dreaming of each other and like the eyes that she would draw and the colors that she would paint with that they were Reese's eyes. And like so much so that later on Nesta now understands like what Pharaoh was drawing. Um, she's like, oh, it was this, it was him. This is who you were connected with. And that Reese had to play such a fine line in, under the mountain. Like that is the best part about this. And that is why when people critique Akatar and call Reese like skeevy for the fact that he puts this girl like naked, makes her dance for him, is touching her everywhere, drugs her, that he does all these things. And people are like, there's no way you can explain that away, blah, blah, blah. Well, number one, I understand. If you don't like dark romances, you're probably not going to like that. But number two, once you get the chance to read this through his head and you realize how much danger Feyre is in, Reese had to be an asshole. Like, he had to be that brutal, just brutal enough that Amarantha didn't kill her. And even so, she kind of was figuring it out at the end. And it almost even wasn't enough what he was doing because Feyre is his like only chance at happiness. And he finds her when they're both in the most ridiculous, you know, situations. He's fighting for the very well-being of his race and people. And Feyre is just trying to save someone she loves, you know. They're just so different but yet they're so the same like they have that same broken part in them where they just want to take care of their loved ones like that that is what like that is the characteristic of Reese that wins Feyre that he puts everyone else above himself that he sells himself into sex slavery for everyone else and that is a, the quality that like Feyre has as well that just bonds them together. And I think it's so beautiful. And I think that to me, Sarah doesn't have to do any more explaining than that. Like I get it. It's enough. I can understand if it's not for others, but it's enough for me that when, when there's that chapter, when they have that time in that cabin and he explains how they got to this point, <clears throat> I understand him. And I'm just like, Feyre, I'm like, eat the soup and let's go to bed. And I'm here for it. The steam in this, it's beautiful. I wish this was fully new adult so we could have some more because there's never enough for me. And then, you know, it leads right into the drama. And I love that they secretly get married. I really, really want there to be like a bonus scene where we get to see the actual wedding. Like someday if Sarah does like a novella collection, I really want to see that. Um, but I love that they end up getting married and then he makes her a high lady and like no one else makes their consorts a high lady. Um, and I love that it hurts so much, but when they break the the um, King of Highburn doesn't break their bond because he can't. You can't break someone's mating bond, but he breaks the um, he breaks the bargain that they made and it and she pretends like she's coming out of a haze and pretends that Reese has been assaulting her and abusing her and manipulating her and goes to Tamlin and is like, please take me home because, Tamlin has a hero complex and he wants to save Feyre, wants to believe all the things he's heard of Reese, and take her home and save her and have everything go back to the way it was before. And it just plays right into it because now Feyre, like Feyre knows who this man is. She doesn't have blinders on. She isn't 
harboring any love for him anymore. She's ready to go. She's game on. She's like, okay, if this is the game we're playing, if this is the war we're fighting, I'm going to destroy you. And I love that. I think Feyre is so strong. And I think it only makes her stronger that we see her be weak. That we see her depend on love in the first book. Like she even says, she's like, I think I just needed someone to need me. And Tamlin was the first, Tamlin was the first one to do that. And I couldn't help but be infatuated by someone finding me beautiful and wanting to sleep with me and wanting to take care of me when I'd been taking care of other people. But that's not what I want forever. I want it to be mutual. I want to mutually care for someone. And Reese needs her. He needs that sanctuary where he can be vulnerable. And Feyre is that for him. And that is why this is one of my favorite romances I've ever read. And specifically how they fall in love in this book, the slow burn of it, the very high stakes, and the respect and dignity that Reese gives to her. Every situation, every mission she comes on, every sexual situation they're in, Reese always gives her a choice, always does. And we get to see this scenario later of the same kind of like putting her in hardly any clothes and using her as an object, only now we get to see her consent to it, which is really beautiful to get to see them working together and getting to, oh my gosh, that scene is so sexy because of the like, he feels like such a horrible man for doing it, but she's so turned on and they can both kind of like let that part go because it's an act. And I just love that. Sarah does sexual tension so well. So I'll stop kind of ranting now. Um, I adore this book, as I've said. These are kind of my deeper dive feelings on it. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think. I've started Wings in Ruin, but it'll probably be a while before I finish it because I'm in the middle of finishing my Outlander reread and Mistborn, and then I need to read Way of Kings. So I kind of need to just wait before I read another thick book. But I'm very much looking forward to doing a deep dive on that one as well. And I'll also do A Court of Frost and Starlight because I'm in like the minor opinion. I really like that book a lot. So I want to do a deep dive on it. And yeah. Uh, thank you so much for watching this. I know these videos aren't as popular, but I wanted to do one on this series. So I'm going to do it. Um, everyone have a wonderful day. I put up new videos three to four times a week and you can watch some more of them right now. Bye.